When a line of duty death occurs, department personnel go through unique experiences based on their position at the time. Only someone that has been through the same type of experience can truly know what that experience is like. NFFF has several outreach programs to assist individuals going through these difficult times with the uniform support programs, including chief, incident commander, and company officer. Today, we will focus on the chief to chief program. Today, we have Fire Chief Lloyd Crago with us. Chief Crago has been the fire chief of Youngwood Volunteer Fire Department for 34 years. Youngwood is a smaller town, 45 miles southwest of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, population of about 3,200 people. The Youngwood Fire Department has 60 volunteers. The department has 500 to 600 runs a year, running a truck, engine, and heavy rescue. At the time of the incident, the department also had a search and rescue dog team. In March of 2014, there was a high profile missing woman case being conducted and all searches had come up negative. The Youngwood Fire Department search and rescue dog team received calls from Swissvale and East Pittsburgh police to assist. Search and rescue team traveled to the location on March 22nd, 2014 on a cool March Saturday morning. Teams searched the areas for hours with good results. As one team was returning to the command post, firefighter Edwin Lance Wenzel was struck and killed by a train. Chief Craig, tell us about firefighter Wenzel. Um, first of all, Chief, thank, for, thank you for having me on, uh, on today. Um, to talk about this incident and uh, hopefully we can you know, learn from it. First thing is Jeff Wenzel. Uh, first, uh, he went by, Je his real name was Edwin. He went by Jeff and we called him Lance. So when I'm talking through this incident, sometimes I might refer to Lance or Jeff, but, it's, it's, um, but Jeff, he was a 30 year plus member you know, of our, our fire department, you know, the fire department. Uh, he was a past assistant chief, captain, and also firefighter of the year uh, for the Elwood Fire Department. Um, let people want people to know the Lance how, how dedicated and committed he was to Youngwood and to the people that surrounded us. Um, he was he was always at the station, always involved with things down there. He, he loved being down there. Anytime you stop down there in the summer or spring, if you, he would be outside, you know, the guy cutting the grass, um, and he always did the dirty jobs at the station. He was uh, a very for, family oriented person. He had two boys and and grandkids. Him and his wife Judy. Um, we're always down the fire hall helping out at you know carnivals and different things like that. Um, so he was always down around the fire department. And almost any time you were in town, you would see him. He was an avid runner. Uh, he loved to run. So if he wasn't at the fire station, you would drive through town. You would see him running, you know, somewhere. Um, one thing I wanted to add to you know Jeff, me and Jeff uh, sort of grew up in the fire department together. He was a little bit older than I was, but uh, he was was assistant chief for me. He was uh, a captain. Uh, we became very good friends, best friends, traveled a lot together and did a lot of things our families did together. So, um, you know, like I said, we, um, we want people to know just he, he, he was dedicated and a diehard firefighter. He loved everything about it. And then um, great guy. He's been missed in uh, our department and our community. So, Jeff, not only you were his fire chief, but you were also his best friend. Yeah, well, we had grown up, uh, you know, did a lot of stuff together, became very good friends over the years, and uh, yeah, we, we did a lot of things together. Chief, tell us about the day of the incident. Yeah, as you said, it was a it was a high profile uh, missing woman uh, person uh, thing going on in the city or outside of Pittsburgh, the Swiss Bell in East Pittsburgh or suburbs of the city of Pittsburgh. Um, we were, I was getting calls. So we had a dog or dog and search and rescue team was getting known. And we, it was only about two years old, but we were getting known to have good results. And, and um, you know, so we started getting calls. And I started getting calls from the family actually about when if I, we would come down and help out. And I explained to them that, well, you know, we couldn't do that unless we were, you know, uh, dispatched or called by an agency that was involved. So, um, you know, on Saturday, March 22nd, actually, we got dispatched about 1.30 uh, in the afternoon uh, by Swiss Belt, you know, the police department to, to, to assist on this missing person. Um, so, you know, our crew got together. Actually, the, the crew we had sent down are, uh, was 13 uh, people. We had myself, uh, two of my captains, 
a safety officer, then three support firemen. We had six handlers and four uh, dogs that day. There was also a medic unit went with us. This was about a 30 to 45 minute trip down you know, to the Swissville area. Um, the team, uh, we all arrived in Swissville. I, at the time I met with the police and received updates. You know, the police were actually still reviewing tapes and trying to confirm some uh, sightings. Police did show me a few locations in town we rode around, but we had no confirmed you know, sightings in town. So we made the decision that we would begin our search at the last known confirmed location of this, this, this person. This was under what was called the Westinghouse Bridge uh, near Keystone Commons um, in East Pittsburgh. So we traveled down to that location. And when we got there, we you know, realized that it was, we left Swissville into a new uh, municipality, which was East Pittsburgh. At that time, we sat there and had to wait for the East Pittsburgh police to arrive. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, once they did arrive, you know, they, they wanted us, they directed us to a different location than where we were waiting. And they said it'd be closer to where they had last seen in the confirmed area of this uh, missing person. They had found a coat and a cell phone. Um, so once we arrived that, we drove up into this location. It was a train yard, you know, a rail yard area. Once we arrived there, we reviewed the area with the East Pittsburgh police and the dog team. You know, we reviewed the, the train traffic and uh, what was going on there. So we, then we set up a staging area. Uh, the staging area, as you can see on the, on the, the drawing, was, was set up uh, in between some you know, different tracks. Um, we had um, on the southern, or one side of us and then the riverside, there was two sets of tracks and above us was uh, one, one set of tracks. And once we set up the command post, just a reminder, you know, the thing that happened, we had, you know, our crews there, we had a media, media was with us because it was a high profile and they wanted to come along. So we had a news vehicle with us and actually a few members of the family um, when we set this up. And so we set this up in between, like I said, as you can see on the, um, the picture there where it was all set up. So, you know, during this, we're, we're talking and uh, we're going over the, the plans and everything. And we did have a train go by at a slower rate. Uh, on the single tracks up above. Um, I sat there and I talked to the police uh, uh, from East Pittsburgh and they said they were going to notify their dispatch of um, you know, uh, us being there, the search team being there most of the afternoon. And they said they would slow or stop all train traffic going through that area. So once we confirmed all, you know, that, that was confirmed from to me and to our, our crew about the, you know, the, the police, I mean, the, the trains being slowed down, everything. So then we started looking at what we want to do. So what we did that day was be, we began two searches. Uh, one was a basic ground search. We started on the southern, uh, on the southern side of the upper tracks, the single tracks. Um, they just did a basic, they started a basic search with a uh, team and, a, and a, a, uh, had a handler, a dog, and a couple of fire support people with them. The second team started, you know, with a scent bag and they started between the river and the, the tracks there, um, the double tracks. Um, the second team was down by the, the, the tracks down the, by the river. They started hitting on some things and they, they started going and you know, the dog was leading them and they actually went into town a little bit. I sort of can't see on the map, but they went to a, a street called Bessemer Avenue. Uh, the dog was at a abandoned house there. So the police were called into that area to check the police and um, or check the house and see if there was anything in there. We didn't find anything in there. So the dog kept trailing, you know, the team kept trailing back, um, you know, back towards uh, where our command post was. But I requested that team to, you know, come back to the station, or, I mean, come back to the command post, you know, get, we'll set back up. Then I, I decided I was going to send the next team out, you know, and that team there was the, the, the canine was Rusty, and Rusty was one of my favorite canines. It was, it's a red uh, Irish setter. Um, and Rusty was tracking, um, so we set him and his team out, and um, and actually Jeff was, uh, and one of my captains was with that team. So they um, so they sent out, and they start the same area. Um, so they called me, and so they were you know hitting the same area. The dog was leading right to the river. Um, so myself and one of the, my other captain, um, we we got in a, a, one of the vehicles, and we drove down to the along the river. Um, to where both teams had tracked to for this missing person. We crossed the double tracks and we looked, for, you know, was looking for some clues or any evidence that was sitting around, anything was going on, you know, might, might have missed by the dog. Uh, we didn't really see anything. Um, we returned back to the command area 
And I called that team and said, you ask him to return. Um, my plan was at that point was going to send one more team out. And if that same team or another team tracked to the same area, I was going to actually call off the search and we were going to call in, you know, river water rescue. So we might, we figured that maybe the, you know, the missing person was went into the river. Um, one thing was, you know, during that, that's, that searches was going on. I did witness a, a few trains passing us. Um, most of it was on the upper track, the single tracks, and they were going at a very slow speed. And um, I can remember talking to the police there and they said, yeah, we'll just double check with dispatch, tell them we're still down here. Um, so that train was coming through at you know, a smaller, or slow rate. So as I was waiting for the, the, the team to return, mm -hmm. I figured at this time I would update the media. The media wanted updated and um, the family wanted some updates. So that was my plan to you know, talk to the media. Um, so I was standing there, I was watching them. I did notice the team starting to walk back towards uh, the command post. They were probably about 150 yards or more down, down the, the tracks. And I didn't see you know, the dog, the handler, two of the handlers and one fireman walking on the, um, the river side of the tr double tracks. And I noticed one fireman walking on the, the other side of the tracks, like right towards the command post, um, you know, as I was standing there watching. Um, then I, you know, I, I walked, uh, or we heard a train, or I seen a train coming on this on a slow speed going away from us towards the bridge on the upper tracks, on the single tracks. Um, at the time I was giving a on, on camera interview with the media just to give them an update, they wanted to know, because the time of day was around five o'clock or five, you know, a little after five, 5.30. And I think they wanted some news for their, you know, so they asked if we would do a you know, live you know, camera um, interview. So we did. So I was doing that. And, and like I said, I just had witnessed everybody walking up. So I um, was getting ready to turn around. And I started walking towards the command post or vehicle. We were going to set up and tell the family the next, you know, what we were going to next team to go out. Just as I turned, I heard you know the somebody from the media, um, the reporter actually. I, I heard him yell, "Chief, somebody just got hit!" And I, I turned around, and actually the time on this was five twenty-eight. I just remember the exact time when I remember looking at my phone as I immediately started running down towards where the accident happened or where I seen you know seen the person get hit. At that time, I didn't know who got hit, you know what it was uh, or who it was. Um, at that time, I started running down, and so some other people, our medics and people, started running towards the scene. Um, as I was running down, I did call my captain, uh, John Story, because um, I didn't know if that was him or who was. But he did answer the phone. He didn't know what happened because he was on. He was the firefighter, or the, the person uh, on the other side of the train or other side of the tracks with the, the dog and the other handlers. As I got to the scene, I realized it was uh, Jeff Wenzel. Uh, Jeff was. Um, unconscious laying on his back he was about 10 feet to 15 feet away from the the, the, the tracks and he had visible injuries you know, all over his body uh immediately we we immediately started uh, trying to resuscitate him uh, for a few minutes like i said we did have medic units already on scene with us um then another ambulance or somebody else called like the local fire department and they sent more crews down but then we loaded him into the ambulance and um, the call had to be made that uh you know, we, this decision was made to stop uh, trying to resuscitate him. And I just remember being, that was the time when, you know, at the end there, um, if, um, if you want to go to the next slide too, just another picture of the scene so you can see what, where it was at. Um, you know, that was, you know, once we stopped resuscitation on him, that's when I just stopped, stepped back, I realized we, I just lost my friend and we just lost the fire department, uh, fireman. The police and detectives in the corners actually end up being on the scene pretty quick. They actually took over the, the scene. Um, and then I just remember make, thinking I have to make some phone calls. Um, the first call I, I did, I made calls to our Westmoreland County 911 and told them what was going on. Um, I called my assistant chief um, that let him know what was going on. And actually I called my wife, I because my wife was good friends with him also. And I just needed somebody to talk to real quick. So those are my three calls, my wife, assistant chief and uh, 911. Um, but, um, and the, the thing, the reason I call this my assistant chief so fast, because I said media was there. Um, they were actually filming, they filmed the whole thing happening. Um, and I knew it was, people would start seeing it and, um, you know, people in Youngwood, it's not, you know, they would start figuring out who's, who was on the, the call and who wasn't and start questioning it. So we, 
we had called his, my assistant chief of meeting, um, and he, you know, took another uh -huh. firefighter with him, and they did go up to see um, Jeff's wife, Judy, um, the, you know, tell her the news report, like I said, the media said they wouldn't say a name, but they did film everything, like I said, I think people would start figuring it out. Um, so, you know, and then we started, you know, when we called 911 and my assistant chief, they started getting people together down at the station. But at that time, we were there still on scene, going over things. And like I said, the, the detectives and the police at the point everybody started showing up, a lot of questions going on. We've got the media out of the area. Um, but we were there for a while. But then, you know, um, we end up, you know, that's when we started returning to the station. Um, like I said, it was 528 when this actually happened. We were there probably for about another half hour, an hour. And I just remember I was, you know, so shook about this. I probably, I, I don't even remember who drove me home. I was in our command vehicle. I don't remember who's driving, but I, I you know, tell people the, the worst thing I've ever said on in my career on their radio was we were returning one short. Uh, and I don't ever wish that on anybody, any other officer to have to say you're one short returning to your station. But uh, that's the incident and the day of um, what happened. So, I mean, that's uh, the, you know, a summary of our day on, uh, uh, March uh, 22nd. Uh, just another, uh, just another picture of the scene, like the of the area where we were at. Chief, you're part of the Chief to Chief Uniform Support Group. Tell us about what you experienced as the incident was unfolding as as Fire Chief. Yeah, I, I think on that that part of it, um, as the fire, like I said. Me and him was good friends and very good friends. And I think as a fire chief, uh, you know, my first incident was, uh, you know, I've just lost my friend. And as the chief, you start looking at like, okay, how's this going to impact the, you know, the um, company? And you can't, you, you always think that this kind of stuff never happens or won't happen to you, especially you know, being a small apartment. And like I said, I made three phone calls that day. You know, like I said, my wife, my, you know, 911 and to my assistant chief. And you know, as things unfolded, Youngwood is a small town, and I, you know, I remember just wanting to get out of there, like get away from the scene after they they transported Jeff from the scene. I just wanted to get out of there because, like I said, the, the family of the missing person was still there; they had left. But then, like you know, more media started coming to the scene, um, and we had it blocked off. I couldn't get in, but uh, and I always said, you know, uh, one of the media guy who was with us, the reporter was that seen it happen, the photographer who filmed it. They were some of the nicest people at that time. They uh, definitely helped us out and said. You know, we'll keep everybody back. We won't release too much information. But as the fire chief, I mean, my, my first thing was just, how's this going to impact the department? And like I said, uh, I, you know, the worst words I ever said was about, you know, going back to the station short. But when I pulled back into the station uh, and seen my, uh, don't, actually, I think for all, I don't know how many members were there, a lot. And it seemed like, in my opinion, it was like half the town was there also when we returned. And uh, just the impact that that has on any department, plus, as like I said, in a small department, it's, it's, it's one of the things you don't plan for or don't think it's going to happen, but it can happen anyway. In a few weeks, it'll be the eighth anniversary. What do you want today's firefighters to know about this? Incident? Yeah, it's like I said, next month it'll be eight years for us. And I think the biggest thing is it can happen to anyone, any but any any size department, any type of call you're on, any, any it don't matter what, you know, um, you know, it, it, it could be anything. It don't matter what kind of I think the big thing I tell everybody, you got to stick together, rely on, and it is, you'll hear it all the time. It's a brotherhood. It definitely is. Um, I realized that more than I ever had in all the years I've been with the fire department and you know, other departments helping out. And I think the other, all departments need to be around when something this happens to somebody close to you also. I think that was the biggest thing that sort of helped us all. And don't be afraid to use resources. Um, and I said, you know, just like now, I'm part of the chief to chief thing with fall, National Fallen Firefighters. I wish I would know more about that before this happened because um, the resources that they offered definitely helped and continue to help me. And I think it, it's definitely people need to know more about the, the resources that we have at the Fallen Firefighters Foundation. Chief, what changes were implemented in your department after the tragedy? Um, I think accountability, um, a follow up for especially for me as a, a, a the chief and even with our officers to follow up. You know, um, you, you, you take for granted. I took for granted that the you know the, the train yard that day, the train companies, all the companies knew about it. 
but the, the train, like the, you know, the, the one said they didn't know anything, nobody was down there. That's why they were going at a faster speed. Um, so it's more follow up and know what's going on. And I say, watch the scene. I do this all the time now, ever since that, I think I do it more, is I watch what's going on, especially on traffic. Uh, in one of our areas is the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Uh, we have a big black I'm just always watching what's going on around, you know, any scene that you're at. I think you got to, as an officer, you got to be watching what's going on. Um, and, and we, in the location of your people, I think that was one of the things that I've changed. I know where all the people are at. Um, you know, I said even that incident, I didn't know which one. I knew one of my firemen just got hit, but I didn't know which who it was. So I didn't know where everybody was at that time. But one thing, uh, you know, one of the changes too is, you know, it made our department, I think, a lot cl uh, closer. Uh, I brought our, you know, everybody together. Um, and then, but, but the bad thing is we've lost members. Not only did we lose, you know, Jeff, uh, we lost other members over this incident because they just didn't want to, put, you know, didn't want to deal with it anymore. Uh, where the, the grief was just affected everybody differently. What, how did your department regain its confidence after this incident? Um, I think regaining confidence is it's it was it took some time, and I think uh, just talking to each other, reviewing. Our team did go out of service for about a week. Um, it, it was more teamwork, support from other departments. Uh, we had other departments and other you know, manpower in our station for about a week. Um, once you know, trying to get through everything. Um, and we, we went back in service and a, a quick story with going back in service as far as confident. Um, our first one of our first call, or our first call back after we went back in service is a vehicle accident on Route 119, which is a highway right through our town. Um, and we're sitting there, it's right at the entrance to the, um, an industrial park and there's train tracks that go through it. We're sitting there after you know, the cleanup, it was a minor accident, waiting for the tow trucks to come and we're sort of waiting around blocking traffic. and a train comes down on the tracks. And I just remember looking thinking, okay, we're good now. Um, you know, sort of a sign, I guess, is what you want to say, but it was a week later, our first call back, a train happens to go by us. But uh, I think uh, we, we, you know, our confidence came back. Uh, one of the things that we did do was there was, you know, we, we did suspend operations of our search and rescue team for a while. And I can talk about that a little bit later here, but, uh, um, but I think getting confidence back after an accident like that or an incident like that is just, you got to talk about it, you got to review it, and you got to stick together as a team and you support and support from your other departments and the brotherhood of firefighters. What did you experience in the aftermath of the incident? Uh, you know, I said the young was a small town, small, small department. Um, you know, in the aftermath of, you know, we, we lost a, we suspended a K9 unit uh, just because of everything. We didn't go on calls, but then it ended up we disbanded the K9 unit totally. So we lost those members. That, you know, we probably had about 10 handlers in that and the dogs. A couple of the handlers stuck around just to be members, but uh, we, we did lose the whole K9 process or team. Um, as I said, we did lose, I don't want to say we lost some members, um, but we, we, we lost some members' activity. We had some very active members and um, they, they, you know, they didn't start, they stopped running, you know, calls. Um, you know, we lost a firefighter. Um, but, and the, 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 the big thing becomes, like I said, we came closer. I think you have to realize people heal in different ways. I think the impact on the firemen and just, you know, how you deal with that. And you need to take care of everybody. And I'll say this, you know, you need to take, take care of yourself. The impact is different on everybody. Um, you know, the ones on scene um, impacted different than the ones who were at the fire hall or weren't on a call, but people and everybody, you know, we were a close department to begin with. Everybody knew who he was. Um, and, you know, we had people come in and meet with everybody, you know, like the counselors and things and, and the funeral and making all the arrangements. And like I said, it was, it, it was the, you know, the line of duty death. We had a lot of media. We had media basically camped out at our station for days. Um, but I encourage you, if you don't have the people, the, the resources, you got to work with them. Like I was fortunate, you know, I had our state fire commissioner, Ed Manns, Manns came in and he was, uh, he helped us make all the arrangements and things like that. Um, so once you get through that initial part, it, it was tough, but then you just got to keep checking on people and making sure everybody's okay, because then everything starts. You don't realize like 
you do get invited to memorials and to different things that talk about it. But then the lawsuits, the paperwork, all that stuff starts. And you don't think about that. But the, my key was making sure all the guys and the people involved and firemen were involved were doing okay. And I will say this, I can't say enough, take care of yourself. I mean, we say it all the time. You know, everybody tries to be the, 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 the leader, the, the person in charge. Uh, and I was the perfect example. I tried to make sure everybody was okay. I didn't do anything for myself. Uh, I did talk to it bottom up. And it was probably, you know, to be honest, it was probably months later. I just remember I was sitting watching TV one night and my wife was working, who's in the medical field too. She was working. I was sitting there by myself and uh, I just had a complete breakdown. I started thinking about the whole everything. And, um, you know, she come home, she's like, you okay? I said, no, I'm not okay. I, you know, I never asked for the help that I was trying to get for all my guys. So I encourage everybody, you know, take care of your crew and your department your and yourself. Yourself's the big one. Chief, what advice would you give to officers and firefighters who may have to deal with? Yeah, the first, the first thing is that, like I just said, take care of yourself too. I mean, everybody, your, your natural instinct is to take care of everybody around you. Uh, but then at some point you got to you know, take care of yourself and, and you need to do that. One thing I say, don't I, I ask people or say, you don't want to replay everything. Uh, don't keep replaying that day and don't keep asking the why. Um, you know, it, it happened, it's over. I mean, you, you sort of look at it and see what you could have changed different, done different, but don't continue to play, you know, replay this over and over in, in your head what went on that day. What, what did we do wrong? What did we do right? What could we have changed? I think that makes it. But the other thing is talk about it. Don't be afraid to talk about it. If somebody comes up to you and asks you what happened or talk, you know, talk about it. The other thing is don't forget it either. Uh, don't forget what happened that day and, and that person. We get new members in our department. And when you walk in, you know, there's a memorial sitting right outside of our station that we built for Jeff. And uh, it'll, I remind people why that's out there. And when you walk into our station, uh, as soon as you walk in, there's a, we have our bunker gears and, and lockers and his locker is uh, glassed over with his gear still inside. So I don't want people to ever forget them, you know, but take care of your teams and take care of yourself. That's the biggest thing and a piece of advice and use your resources. Uh, like I said, you know, if you don't know about the you know, fallen firefighters and, and the resources that they offer, please let your neighboring departments and other people around you know about that. Don't, don't turn down any uh, you know, resources and things like that. Uh, the biggest piece of advice is that take care of your crew, take care of yourself. Uh, um, and like I said, but don't forget that firefighter. Thank you so much, Chief. Is there anything else that you would like to add that we didn't talk about? Uh, just the thanks to the National Fallen Firefighters uh, you know, the Foundation for what all they've done for me uh, in our department over the years. And then now, especially to the, the IC to IC, the Chief to Chief uh, programs. It's, it's, uh, I think it's a great programs. It stinks how you're, it's not very good how I've learned about them. Um, but uh, I'm happy to be a part of them. And you know, I, I encourage everybody else to get the, the information out to all departments and just be there for when something happens in your department. But thanks uh, for having me on today. Thanks, Chief, so much for sharing your story and your experiences for so many of us to learn from. I want to thank everybody for, uh, for listening in today as well. But, uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, listening to, to Chief Crago's uh, important message today and uh, thanks for tuning in to uh, NFFF Connect.